stress. So the significance is then you're capable of rewriting a genes. But here's the most important part. What was not even included in the other chart, but is now included, and it wasn't there before? And the answer is these two boxes right here, the environment and organism's perception of the environment. Look where the arrows go. What can the environment do? Organism's perception of the environment. What can it do? It can rewrite your genes, number four, or it can change your physio physiological body to respond to the environment. What's the relevance of all this? Well, the environment was never even included in conventional biology. Now the environment is found to be very important, and more so, and look, environment, that's the slide we showed, is the environment. Organism's perception. We said perception is belief. And what does it affect? The cells. In what way? By rewriting the genes and changing the structure of the cells. The bottom line is this. Your belief in a stressful situation will rewrite your genes to accommodate the stress. And the relevance about that is that if the if, if stressful environment is something that's not even real out there, you will change your biology to fit what you believe. And the issue is this, then specific organs and specific tissues of the body are connected to the beliefs. Specific stresses affect different portions of your body. And as a result, if you understand which portion of your body is affecting the stress, then you can deal with it by understanding what emotions are eliciting that stress. And it's just very critical to understand this, is that the, the symptoms of your body are your, your body telling you that you're under stress. That's clear. But the point about stress, because if you're not dealing with it, we're going to have a problem in here. And here's the interesting point. When we go to conventional medical care, what do they do with the symptom? They cover it up. So you don't feel anything anymore. Information can go from protein back into RNA, and now we know RNA can go back into DNA. And since the protein is reading the environment, it says that the environment can change the DNA, and this is now becoming a known fact in science as well, so that the information is now going both ways. Why is this important? Because when a normal, when we go to an OBGYN checkup, if you're if you are pregnant, what is the doctor primarily interested? Eating right? Do you have enough vitamins? Do you have enough minerals? It's like belief is this. What is the role of the mother in conventional belief? Understand this. If the child is developing from the sperm and egg with the genes, and the conventional belief is that all the programming is in the genes then the mother doesn't provide anything but nutrition. The point is this, we know this is not right anymore. We know that the environment can change the genes. So the bottom line is this, the mother is now found to be providing information that the mother is adjusting the genes of the child. But it's not the mother alone. The mother is in cohorts with the father. So as the mother's perception of life is altered, it's usually in tandem with the husband. So it's not just the mother, it's the parents are affecting the offspring in this way. That, watch the lecture, James, first, first part of the lecture. Perception. The embryo is growing in uterus. What is it perceiving? What environment does the embryo perceive? The mother, because it feeds off of the mother's blood. Cool. What does the mother's blood have in it? Of course it has nutrients in it. That's what provides the nutrition. What else does the mother's blood have in it? all the hormones and the molecules that organize her body to respond to the environment that she perceives. So guess what? The fetus is reading that. So the fetus is adjusting to the environment that the mother perceives. Why is that? Because nature is so intelligent. It said that the sperm and egg come together in, in, in the middle of Africa or the middle of, of Chicago. It's, they're two different environments. The two kids are not going to adjust the same in each environment, but the kid has to adjust before it's born. So it turns out that the mother is nature's head start program. It helps the child select the genes that will be necessary for that child to survive in the environment because the child is going to live in the environment that the mother perceives. So Nolan Newsweek uh, last year came out and said, where health begins, obesity, cancer, and heart attacks, how your odds are set in the womb. This new understanding of the child are dying to immediately be adapted to that environment that the mother lives in. However, since perceptions are beliefs, and since beliefs are not necessarily accurate, them, the parents' perceptions are genetically selecting, you know, or, or genetic selection mechanisms for the child. Parents are genetic engineers. They're selecting genes. In an environment that's threatening, perception system is activated. In a supportive environment, growth is activated. Here's an embryo 
The organs and tissues that develop, develop in re relationship to the amount of blood they receive. The more blood they receive, the more better their development. Simple, obvious nourishment growth process. IQ potential is determined by the prenatal environment based on the perception of the mother during pregnancy. And that says, look at the way we raise kids today. Look at parents in inner city situations. Look at parents that are single parents that don't know whether they'll be able to provide for their child and for themselves. These parents live under high stress. When they live under high stress, the stress hormones cross the placenta and impact the child, selecting genes which alter the development and evolution of that child. As you haven't given attention to the reality that the child is being programmed genetically in utero. The functions of the body to survive can be broken down to two basic functions for any organism to survive. You have to be able to grow, maintain yourself, take care of your biology, but you also must be able to protect yourself so that if you're just growing and you can't protect yourself, you'll become food for something else. So the uh, survival involves a balance between growth and protection. Through the history of human civilization and through a human evolution, we recognize that our nature is to be in a state of growth and that our protection is only supposed to be used to you know, help us out of that, that threatening moment. You can't be in growth and in protection at the same time. So the significance is, when we see a need of protection, the stress hormones in the body shut off the blood vessels in our viscera or gut, which is the part of the body for growth. Well, the issue is, if you took the blood from the viscera and moved it out to the arms, then you left no blood in the viscera. That means no growth, but you're ready to fight. And when your fighting is finished, then the blood returns back to the viscera and you grow again. But in the world that we live in today, in response to the mother's perception. It's 24-7 fear. So we have a continuous dripping of that stress hormone into the body. It's just dripping all the time, getting us ready to run or fight or flight at any moment at the drop of a hat. We're ready to go because we're on guard. Well, the problem is, what does that mean about your allocation of energy? And it says, Actually, it came out of nowhere. The conscious mind is the creative mind. It's the one that has your personal identity into it. It does the, the, the real thinking. And then there's a subconscious mind. Well, there's no entity in it. The subconscious mind is the equivalent of a tape player. It records behaviors, and then at the push of a button, plays a behavior. It's automatic. It's a very convenient thing, because then we don't have to relearn all the time. Once you know it, you can make a pattern. The problem is that the basic patterns of belief and behavior that are programmed in the subconscious mind came from our teachers. Are we leading conscious or unconscious lives? And now neuroscience has told us in the unfolding of our lives, only 5% of our life is controlled by our conscious mind and 95% of the time controlled by the subconscious with programs from other people that were installed in there. And the problem is, it means when those programs are playing, we don't see them. Control over. What we're seeing right now is with all the competition of each other destroying each other, wars, competing for material existence, raping the planet and tearing it apart to get some pieces of it to hold in your hands and say you won the game. Every one of those moves is destructive, not just of the planet, but of human civilization, because human civilization will thrive with cooperation and will die with competition. And if you operate from these truths, then you end up with 1967. I'd isolate one stem cell, put it in a petri the extinction dish and then it would divide every 10 hours. So I took all the cells, split them up into three groups, and then just put them in three Petri dishes. And then I changed the growth medium, the constituents of the environment, in each of the three dishes. In one dish, the cells form bone. The second dish, they form muscle. And the third dish, they form fat cells. What controlled the fate of a cell? And the first thing you have to say is, well, wait, they were all genetically identical when they were put in a dish. So obviously the genes didn't control it because they all had the same genes. What was different was the environment. And all of a sudden in my career, it said, oh my gosh, here I am teaching genes control life and the cells are telling me genes respond to life. And since you can control the response, you can control your life. 
It's how you read the environment, how your mind perceives the environment. And if you understand this, then you could lead yourself to the most wonderful expression on this planet to be fully alive.